Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Alaska Collaborative on Health and the Environment webinar entitled Urgent Action on Forever Chemicals, the Scientific Basis for Managing PFOS as a Chemical Class. I'm your host, Nick Reardon, calling in from Alaska Community Action on Toxics office here in Anchorage, Alaska on the traditional and unceded lands of the Denina people. My coworkers and I are grateful to past and present stewards of this place we call home, and these circumstances and gratitude inform and inspire our work to protect the health of future Alaskans. For those of you new to this webinar series, the Alaska Collaborative on Health and the Environment is a regional partner of a national collaborative on health and the environment. We often abbreviate it as CHE, CHE, and so CHE and CHE Alaska and other CHE partners work together to advance knowledge as well as action related to these links between human health and environmental factors like PFOS, the focus of our time together today. We organize these webinars, or when organizing them, we try our best to select issues that are of particular importance to Alaskans. So considering how our state and communities are impacted, um, the solutions that make the most sense for us. And with that in mind, I wanna welcome you, our audience, to reach out with suggestions. What environmental health issues and concerns are important to you? What would you like to learn more about? What issues will require collective action to address? So you can share these ideas and requests in the chat today, but really contact us directly at your convenience by email or phone. I was looking back and it's uh, a little bit startled. Che Alaska started over 15 years ago. And uh, you, some of you may already know this, but we maintain a list of topics as well as recordings of past Che Alaska teleconferences and webinars. And so I invite you to take a look at it um, at our website, akaction.org. And I'll pop, uh, I'll pop that, that link into the chat. A special thanks to Alaska state legislators and their staff who could join us today. We very much appreciate you taking the time to tune in and for your ongoing concern about your constituents' health. Uh, I understand today's topic on PFOS and how best to regulate these substances is being actively debated in our state house and Senate. And so we appreciate your ongoing efforts to protect Alaskans' access to safe drinking water and uh, your support for House Bill 171 and Senate Bill 121. In the interest of staying up to date on the science, a new paper was just published last month entitled PFOS in Drinking Water and Serum of the People of a Southeast Alaska Community, a pilot study. And it was written by members of the Gustavus PFOS Action Coalition. My coworkers here at Alaska Community Action on Toxics were also co-authors and uh, collaborators at Indiana University. And the study assesses PFOS exposure in Gustavus, Alaska, um, which is unfortunately located near a significant PFOS source from airport operations and fire training sites. So the study found 14 distinct PFOS in Gustavus water samples and even more 17 different PFOS in, in blood serum and that the, the contaminated drinking water from private wells contributes to the overall PFOS body burden in Gustavus residents. I've added this recent publication to our resource list and that, that's, we, can, we can get into this another time. So um, without further ado, we're so very grateful to be joined by Dr. Carol Kukowski, the Science and Policy um, Senior Associate at the Green Science Policy Institute. Dr. Krakowski is also the adjunct assistant professor at North Carolina State University and former director of the nonprofit, the Endocrine Disruption Exchange. Uh, she has presented and published extensively on the connections between human health and the environment, teaches on the subject, and is the lead researcher and author of a recent report that brings us together here today, that being scientific basis for managing PFOS as a chemical class. So welcome again, Dr. Krakowski. Thank you so much for joining us and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate that introduction. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I always enjoy being on a Che Alaska call, whether I'm listening or speaking and, uh, and all of the Che uh, calls are great. So I, I'm happy to be here. And uh, 
I know that many of you in the audience are, uh, know a lot about PFAS and you're already working on the problem of PFAS pollution. So my goals today are to bring you some new ideas um, like the essential use approach, to introduce you to resources you may not know about and to suggest actions you might personally take to help move us towards getting rid of all unnecessary uses of PFAS. The paper referenced in the title of my talk was a wonderful collaboration of many outstanding scientists who each contributed their time and expertise to making this a very influential paper. So I wanted to take a moment to just put their names up on the, the screen here and you can see the organizations too. Um, it's a wide variety of nonprofits and government agencies and academics. And the paper has had over 46,000 views to date and cited nearly a hundred times already. So we know that it's getting a lot of attention and I think that's it's great for something like this to be getting out there into people's hands. Um, you should have a link to it in your meeting invitation if you wanna see the actual paper. I wanna say a few things about the Green Science Policy Institute. We are a small nonprofit that packs a big punch and the three pillars of our work are research, collaboration, and communication. We conduct studies and we write reviews and scientific commentaries as part of our research. We collaborate with a lot of different organizations holding retreats and workshops and meetings with academics and government scientists and industry leaders as well as other nonprofits. Uh, and we have a communications plan that we not only do we do it, but we share it with other people because we think it works really well and it allows us to get a lot of attention to what we're doing. Um, all of this is an effort to create positive change for a healthier world. Today, I'm going to talk about the class-based approach to managing chemicals of concern. We know there are tens of thousands of chemicals used in industrial and consumer products, and most of them we know very little about. And yet many of the products we use every day contain chemicals that may be harming our health trying to manage them one at a time, which is how most chemicals are evaluated by government agencies, is clearly impossible. Many years ago, the Green Science Policy Institute developed an approach that we call six classes. By organizing substances into classes or large groups of similar chemicals, they can be assessed together. This helps us better understand the chemicals, their functions, where they're used, and how they can be avoided. The goal is to move us more quickly towards reducing harm. Most importantly, it can be used to avoid what is called regrettable substitution, which I know many of you are familiar with. Um, when one chemical is removed, restricted, or banned because it's deemed hazardous, industry is often already prepared to replace it with another very similar chemical, often from the same class, that will then have to be evaluated individually for its health hazards. This can take years, even decades, and it's thus referred to as regrettable substitution. By managing groups of similar chemicals together, this can be avoided. The six classes that we've identified are highly fluorinated chemicals, also known as PFAS, antimicrobials, flame retardants, bisphenols and phthalates, some solvents, and certain metals. Now this doesn't capture every chemical, but it's a really helpful organizational tool, especially for companies, to direct their efforts towards addressing most of the major classes of harmful chemicals. To get an overview of each of the classes in a very short amount of time, you can watch a four minute video on each class on our website at sixclasses.org. Today we're talking about PFAS, which are per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, sometimes referred to as highly fluorinated chemicals or PFCs. A few brand names you might recognize are Scotchgard, Teflon, and Gore-Tex. And the most well-known PFAS are PFOA, that's P-F-O-A, and PFOS, P-F-O-S. But there are over 12,000 other compounds in this very large class of chemicals. They're used in thousands of consumer products, primarily because of their oil and water repellent properties that create stain-proof, waterproof, and non-stick surfaces. Some examples shown on the slide are clothing, cosmetics, outdoor gear, food packaging, firefighting foam, and car seats. They're also used in industrial applications as lubricants and surfactants, dispersants, and emulsifiers. One study has estimated over 200 different uses of PFAS, although we really know very little about the broad range of ways in which they're used in products and processes. 
Within the large class of PFAS are some common properties. The one that they all share is persistence. They either do not break down or they break down into other PFAS. That's because the bond between the carbon and fluorine atoms is virtually unbreakable under normal environmental conditions. In fact, even with great effort, such as through incineration, complete destruction of PFAS doesn't always happen. Many of them are also very mobile chemicals. They travel long distances in water and air and pollute even the most remote places, such as the Arctic. And they can accumulate or build up in the environment and in people and wildlife. And many of them are toxic to humans or other species. And unfortunately, PFAS have been detected in humans around the world. Over 98% of people in the US have measurable amounts of PFAS in their bodies. That means most of us right here on this call. <clears throat> One positive thought is that levels of PFOA and PFAS have declined following phase outs of those two chemicals, which demonstrates that stopping the production of PFAS can actually make a difference. The problem of PFAS was brought to national attention by the efforts of attorney Rob Ballot, who uncovered massive PFOA contamination from a DuPont factory in West Virginia that was making fluoropolymers. The film Dark Water starring Mark Ruffalo does a beautiful job of telling that story. And if you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend it. There are in fact many hotspots of contamination across the US and around the world. Polluted drinking water is a huge issue. It's estimated that over 200 million people in the US have unacceptable levels of PFAS in their drinking water. That's greater than one part per trillion. Now, currently the NIH is initiating a big research effort to try and figure out what to do about all the water contamination from PFAS and other chemicals, especially in the context of all the different threats we're facing to water quality these days. So that's really good. You can keep your eye out for what might come out of that effort. Estimates of safe levels of PFAS in drinking water have been going down steadily over the last three decades. In 1987, DuPont thought it was okay to have 5,000 parts per trillion of PFOA in drinking water. In 2009, the US EPA set a health guideline at 400 parts per trillion, and seven years later, they reduced that to 70 parts per trillion. Today, some states have set levels as low as 0.1 part per trillion. This is just for one single PFAS. Yet we know from biomonitoring studies that people often have many PFAS in their bodies at once. Unfortunately, the federal government uses animal studies to set maximum contaminant levels, but there's so little animal research on PFAS mixtures that we don't know what the combined health effects are. The OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, defines PFAS as fluorinated substances that contain at least one fully fluorinated carbon atom. That carbon-fluorine bond is the unbreakable man-made bond that defines this class as forever chemicals. And so if you think about it, if PFAS never go away, they just keep accumulating. Meanwhile, as we just saw, what is considered a safe level of exposure keeps getting lower as more and more research comes out on health hazards. So every time we lower the safe level or find more evidence of environmental exposure, the number of people currently exposed to unsafe levels is going up and up and up just by new, gaining new information. Exposure to PFAS occurs at all stages in the life cycle of the chemicals, including production use and disposal. At production sites, it's emitted throughout air and wastewater because emission filters don't completely capture PFAS, especially the ones with short chain carbon, shorter carbon chains, sorry. Even if the filters did capture all the PFAS, we don't currently have a way of disposing of the filter safely. So that's a problem. Um, sludge is, has often been spread on agricultural soil and that contaminates the crops. During the use phase, there's contamination of food, especially fish and shellfish, meat, eggs, and milk from uh, these animal products can be from contaminated feed or water. Food can also be contaminated by food packaging. Drinking water is contaminated as is air and house dust is a big source of exposure through um, for humans. And then during disposal, um, there's exposure through incineration byproducts, there's leachate from landfills and um, the recycled materials 
products um, have PFAS contamination in them. So all of these things are important to consider. It's not just from one or the other. I encourage you to check out the Environmental Working Group's PFAS contamination map. I centered this um, screenshot on Alaska so you could see that well, but you can also see what the rest of the US looks like. The <clears throat> one thing to remember, there's, there's so many dots there on that map, they're just, just becoming one mass of uh, color showing you the different contamination sites, whether it's from military sites, drinking water, or other known sites of contamination. And the thing to remember is that areas without the dots are often just areas that haven't been measured yet. Because with PFAS, the more you look, the more you find. People most at risk for PFAS exposure are those living near chemical and production manufacturing sites, airports, military bases, because of their use of, of PFAS firefighting foams, landfills, wastewater treatment plants, incinerators, and areas where PFAS contaminated sludge has been spread as a soil amendment. These are often low-income communities and or communities of color that are already overburdened by other pollutants in their air, water, food, and indoor and outdoor environments. I've already given you so much bad news, I hate to keep going on and on, but <laughs> there are many health hazards associated with PFAS. They affect so many different systems in the body. Um, some of the known effects with PFAS have been definitively linked to are kidney and testicular cancer, elevated cholesterol, liver disease, decreased fertility, thyroid and other hormone problems, and decreased immunity or immune response to vaccines in children and adults, which is very concerning in light of the importance of vaccines today. Several studies have shown interactions between levels of certain PFAS and the coronavirus including increased susceptibility, increased severity of symptoms, and even mortality. And most of the what we know about health hazards comes from research on PFOA and PFOS, the two legacy chemicals with longer carbon chains, and these have been phased out in the U.S., but we're quickly learning that their short-chain replacements are just as bad. We've known about most of those health effects that I just showed you for decades. Uh, here I wanted to call attention to some new research coming out of NIEHS's National Toxicology Pro Program, specifically Sue Fenton's lab. They just published a paper describing how both long and short chain PFAS disrupt normal reproductive function in women by altering hormone secretion, menstrual cycles, and fertility. They also published a paper recently showing high levels of long chain and short chain PFAS in human breast milk. And a 2021 study of PFOA and its replacement, Gen X, <clears throat> showed increased weight gain, fat mass, and insulin sensitivity in prenatally exposed male mice dosed with Gen X. So this is notable because it's the metabolic effects, it's um, prenatal exposure, and it's this replacement chemical of Gen X. And in that same study, females showed evidence of liver damage from both PFOA and Gen X. So again, more and more um, health effects research coming out that's, that's not looking good. Here, I wanted to introduce you to a new re resource you may not be aware of. I was part of the team who created the PFAS Talks database, where you can see the research on over a thousand uh, human, animal, and in vitro studies that have been conducted on 29 specific PFAS, the ones that are commonly found in the environment or in people. And uh, we didn't include PFOA and PFOS in this database because that literature base is just too large and it would have delayed completing the project by another two years. So this was, this was what we could get out and we thought was the most important. I just found a, a, a neat tool here. I'm gonna zoom in on this um, image here and blow it up so you can see, <coughs> excuse me. This is what the database looks like when you open it up. You can see here that for these 29 PFAS in the left column, there's over 600 studies just on PFNA. Um, PFNS has as the lowest with only one, one study on that. Um, so others that you might be interested in are Gen X that shows 29 studies. Um, Adana has five and Nathion Byproduct 2 has two studies. 
And these are broken down into or displayed according to 14 different health effect categories, metabolic system, um, body weight, size and growth, the endocrine system, it's got the nervous system, the immune system, and the um, program organizes it. So the higher number of studies and the darker color is up here in this corner so that they're in order with the most number of studies. One thing to be aware of is that the numbers in these little boxes don't reflect like the number of significant effects that were found. It's the number of studies that have looked at these effects. Not all of them will be significant. So we wanted to include both the significant and non-significant effects. When you go and click on one of these boxes, um, it shows you, it lists all the studies and you can click on the studies and get a pop-up and it tells you all the methodological details of the, um, of the research and what, what the outcomes were, um, not necessarily the significant values of this significant results, but gives you a lot of information and gives you a link to the study. So you can um, go check that out for yourself. At, it's at pfasttalksdatabase.org. I also wanted to make you aware of a few position statements on PFAS. Um, it takes a lot to get medical organizations to speak out about environmental chemicals. So these were really noteworthy in my estimation. The International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics has a statement on PFAS calling for the removal of all PFAS from global usage. And the American Public Health Association has a policy statement on the public health importance of reducing human exposure to PFAS. So you can easily find these online by Googling, you know, for their statements, but I wanted to mention them here because I think they can be useful in some context if you're trying to convince health practitioners or health agencies that PFAS are a problem. And then there's also scientific statements such as the Madrid Statement on Highly Fluorinated Chemicals. This was signed by 230 scientists from 40 countries calling for limiting the production and use of PFAS and for the development of safer alternatives. And this had a big impact. It was, came out in 2015, but helped raise awareness of the problems of PFAS and bring it to the forefront of public and policy attention. So we know that PFAS are bad. And if everything I just presented doesn't convince you, then maybe Trevor Noah and John Oliver of Late Night TV um, will, will do the trick. Um, this is actually really good news that PFAS have made the big screen like this, um, reaching millions of viewers. So few toxic chemicals ever get that kind of attention. And um, they even showed uh, a picture of our paper about managing PFAS as a class on late night TV, which was kind of ex exciting. That may be 30 seconds of my 15 minutes of fame that I get in my lifetime. So why is managing PFAS as a class such an important approach? The simple answer to that is time. Government agencies typically study chemicals one at a time or in small groups using the process of risk assessment to evaluate toxicity and exposure. But these chemicals have been polluting our environment for 80 years since the 1940s, and we know they never go away. There truly is no away for PFAS. We also keep finding out about new PFAS. EPA's master list, which comes from environmental detection research and, and companies reporting their uses and other things, that number just keeps increasing. So it's now over 12,000. Meanwhile, we don't even have the scientific methods to study most of the ones we know about. So we really don't know anything about the vast majority of them in terms of health and exposure. I feel like this graphic here really says it all. And I think that the NRDC's fact sheet, which is also based on managing PFAS as a class is a great resource if you want a little couple pages to go over to explain it. <clears throat> We've been stuck in this one chemical at a time method for a long time, but a lot of people are now promoting a new, a new approach that goes hand in hand with the class-based approach called essential uses. Using this approach, uses of harmful chemicals are assessed, not toxicity and exposure. So the 10 years that it takes to figure out if the chemical is toxic and how we're exposed to it can be sidestepped to a much quicker approach where you're, you say these are chemicals of concern and we wanna limit the uses of them. And through this process, all non-essential uses 
of chemicals of concern are eliminated and only those that are essential for health, safety, or the functioning of society and do not have safer alternatives are allowed to continue. And only on a time limited basis can we continue to use those until safer alternatives are found. And this approach is already being adopted in the EU and China and other countries, as well as several US states, although not the federal government yet. And more and more businesses are adopting this approach as well, trying to rid their products of harmful chemicals. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it. One way to apply the approach is to break it down into three questions. And you can ask any one of these questions. It's not a one, two, three order kind of thing. But you can ask, is the product essential for health safety or the function of society? And if not, for example, your lipstick, then PFAS should be removed from lipstick. You could also ask, is the function of the chemical necessary? If not, for example, with waterproof bathing suits, you might need a bathing suit, but you don't necessarily need a waterproof bathing suit. And so PFAS can be removed from bathing suits. And then the third question you could ask is, are there no safer alternatives? If there are safer alternatives, such as for grease-proof grease -proof food packaging, then PFAS should be moved from that scenario as well. So any one of these questions answering no to it can allow you to stop the use of PFAS in that scenario. It's only if the answer to all three questions is yes, would the chemical be considered essential. So an example of that would be surgical gowns. They're essential for health and safety. The chemical's function of waterproofing against bodily fluids is essential to the product. And there aren't currently any safer alternatives, at least for long surgeries where breathability is necessary. So there's been a, a lot published on the essential use approach. Um, I encourage you to, to look for it and learn about it. I'm currently collaborating with a group of scientists from academia and NGOs and government to produce a paper on the essential use approach with specific recommendations for how it can be applied within the context of current regulatory processes in the US and Canada. And so we hope to get that submitted very soon. I also wanted to spend some time talking about what governments and businesses are doing in terms of addressing PFAS and applying the essential use approach. The most wide reaching application of the essential use approach is in the European Union. The EU sustainability strategy calls for removal of all unnecessary uses of PFAS. So they've made that statement. Now they're working on how to implement the approach, which is, as I said, based on the essential use um, approach. There's good news from China as well, in that the newest version of their chemical registration law requires proof of necessity of use for all highly hazardous chemical substances, and that also an analysis of socio and economic benefits, including environmental friendliness. So that's also a step in the right direction. <clears throat> U.S. federal policy is primarily directing funds towards research and developing cleanup strategies. Uh, the U.S. military is also requiring certain products that they purchase to be PFAS free, which includes some uses of firefighting foams and some food packaging for military personnel. And this is a big step. They're big purchasers and it, it does set a great example. The EPA specifically in the federal government has done several things, including their strategic roadmap, which addresses many facets of PFAS pollution. You can go see this online. Um, I don't know a lot of um, specific actions that have been taken to date, but you can see what they're proposing to do. One thing is that they've instituted a one-time reporting rule requiring companies that use PFAS to report their usage information to the EPA. And with that data, we should learn a lot about how and where PFAS are used, which would fill a big gap in our understanding of PFAS. The EPA's Toxics Office also recently released their um, working definition that covers about 6,500 PFAS that they'll use for their national testing strategy. So that is also approaching a class approach. Um, and um, this, it's slightly narrower definition. They're not using the LEC definition. Um, they have a, a slightly narrow definition that excludes pesticides, pharmaceuticals, and some refrigerant gases. 
one problem with that is that some of the excluded PFAS break down into toxic chemicals like PFOA and PFAS, and also the production of some excluded PFAS requires the use of other more dangerous PFAS compounds. But it's good that they've come up with a, a working definition that does address a lot of different PFAS. EPA also wants to use the Toxic Substances Control Act to regulate the use of fluorinated HDPE containers. Those are high density polyethylene containers um, and, and other types of plastic barrels as well that are used for pesticides because they found out that PFAS are contaminating the pesticides in the barrels. Um, and they're also concerned that this type of contamination from fluorinated plastic containers may be occurring with other products. So they're looking into that as well. The FDA is focusing on testing for PFAS in foods and deciding how to address PFAS in cosmetics. Those are the areas that fall within their purview. Um, for cosmetics, they're looking at both research needs and a possible ban on PFAS in cosmetics. So that's the US national level. A lot of other countries are also addressing PFAS in various capacities. Uh, Australia has a national plan that's mostly focused on cleanup. They're also have been doing some work to uh, manage their use of firefighting phones. Denmark has banned all PFAS in paper and paperboard food packaging. Germany is working on PFAS in soil uh, due to high levels of contamination from a paper uh, processing sludge that was spread on agricultural lands. So I've mentioned this a couple of times, but plants and fruits and corn, especially crops with high water content, they take up short chain PFAS from the soil. So Germany's trying to determine the values for soil cleanup and the US is working on this as well. Um, but in Germany, they're also considering moving to require pre-market testing of food crops to determine if they can be sold or have to be destroyed. That would be a, a big move to say that we can't sell this food because it's been contaminated with PFAS. Um, so we're keeping an eye on that. And these are just a couple of examples. There are a lot of countries that are finding contamination and trying to create their own national policies around it. And in terms of US states, it's hard to keep up with all the great work that's going on, on the at the state level around PFAS. There's currently 202 policies across 30 different states. So when I looked at this uh, website the last time from saferstates.org, I looked up Alaska and you all probably know more about this than I do, but they're requiring um, their rep responsible parties to test for PFAS in all drinking water when PFAS substance is released in the area of a water supply. It also allows state fire marshals to require PFAS-free firefighting foam and establishes maximum contaminant levels for PFAS in drinking water. I looked up Colorado where I live and I'm excited about a new bill here that aims to collect use information from companies and most importantly, to phase out the sale or distribution of products that contain intentionally added PFAS. And I also looked up Green Science Policy or California, because that's where Green Science Policy is located. And there are several different bills. I mean, I say that I looked it up here. It's not that I didn't know anything about what was going on in these states, but um, specifically, they have bills on drinking water, textiles, cosmetics, and public disclosure of PFAS. So um, it's also exciting that other states like Maine are writing the essential use approach into their policies. Um, the main thing that I wanted to get across with this slide was to introduce you to saferstates.org if you're not already aware of them because they have this great map and you can click on each state and you can look up specifically which bills are available. So, and it's, things are changing fast. So you can go back and visit often. So what are businesses doing around PFAS? We work with a lot of different companies and we're happy to report that Businesses in many different sectors and levels in the supply chain are stepping up to phase out all PFAS from their products. Um, major carpet manufacturers have phased out PFAS in commercial and residential carpets and the retail chain Home Depot has committed to stop selling carpets with PFAS. Lots of other companies have committed to removing PFAS or have already done so for many of their product lines. And some brands are even beginning to label products, which is great for consumer education. Um, if you're looking at a label and you see 
PFAS free, that's good. If you see PFOA free, it could mean that there is a, another PFAS as a substitute. So look for the PFAS free label. Some large institutions are also addressing PFAS, including things like in hospital purchasing and um, university buildings. We work with a lot of people in the building industry, like architects, designers, and specifiers, as well as um, big groups like the Healthy Building Network and various certification programs. So these are all groups that are working to remove PFAS and other harmful chemicals from building materials. One recent and very exciting development is that the International Living Building Institute's Living Building Challenge, which a lot of people pay attention to, it maintains a red list of chemicals that can't be used in buildings that they certify. They just added about 5,000 PFAS to their list and they plan to add several thousand more next year. So that's a really great example of the class approach and how it can be used by businesses or this is a certifier in this, <clears throat> in this instance um, to be used by businesses. And um, we hope that makes a big difference. One great example of the essential use approach is uh, with Keen Footwear. We've worked with Keen for many years and very proud of what they've accomplished. They made a commitment many years ago to eliminate all PFAS from their footwear. They first identified all the sources of PFAS and were very surprised to find 101 different uses of PFAS in their footwear. So a lot of product manufacturers are similarly unaware that they're selling products with PFAS. There's just not that level of knowledge in the supply chain always. Keen was able to determine relatively quickly that 70 of those uses were not even necessary. So once they identified them, it was not as difficult to remove them as you might think. Um, so they removed those uses and then they focused on evaluating the remaining uses and finding safer substitutes, eventually removing all PFAS from their products. The other great thing that they did was they shared their process publicly. I think they took out a whole page ad in the New York Times or something like that and even issued a challenge to other outdoor gear companies to do the same. So instead of using this to compete for market share, they encouraged competitors to also do the right thing, which is a really great example. It's very encouraging that so many companies today are responding to um, whatever pressures they are um, from, whether it's from regulations coming down the pike or their shareholders or customers um, who are asking for healthier products because businesses can move so much more quickly than government agencies. So um, this also is encouraging because it puts some power in the hands of the consumers and it's a, an effective way of producing change more quickly. Um, another thing that we do at the Green Science Policy Institute is, is manage the Materials Buyers Club, where we work with very large purchasers of building materials and they use their collective purchasing powers to push for transparency from manufacturers on what chemicals are in their building material products. So this is trying to help with that supply chain issue and get the chemical manufacturers to be more transparent about what they're using um, and also to demand healthier products and materials be used. The goal is for this information to then be available to all businesses to be able to build healthier buildings with a specific emphasis on a healthier low-income housing. So if you're curious about where PFAS are used in building materials, you can check out the report that we produced last year called Building a Better World. It's on our website. So obviously there's, it's not all good news. There's some resistance from chemical manufacturers to the class approach. And I'm gonna talk about three areas in particular um, where there's pushback and that's fluoropolymers, refrigerant gases and pharmaceuticals. Fluoropolymers are a huge proportion of PFAS production. They're used in products like Teflon and Gore-Tex and PFAS manufacturers contend that fluoropolymers which are these long strings of linked PFAS are too large to enter cells and harm living things. And therefore they should be excluded from regulation. But what they fail to mention is that fluoropolymers release massive amounts of smaller harmful PFAS throughout their life cycle. And they're responsible for extensive environmental PFAS contamination. So they should absolutely be considered in, as part of the class of PFAS. The other area is in refrigerant gases. Chemical, 
chemical manufacturers defend the use of fluorinated refrigerant gases, but these PFAS also degrade into smaller chemicals such as trifluoroacetic acid or TFA, which industry contends is not harmful. But TFA is a PFAS, it's hazardous, it's highly persistent, and it's hard to remove from drinking water. If you think about all the grocery store refrigerators that are running 24 hours a day and industrial air conditioning, and there's just lots of uses of these fluorinated gases. It's pretty high volume. Um, and they've been measuring levels of TFA in the environment and finding that they are increasing rapidly. It was measured in Canada at 10 times higher than before these gases were used which was before the 1987 Montreal Protocol. These, these became, these are basically regrettable substitutes for other chemicals, hydrofluorocarbons. Um, also high levels of TFA have been found in China and Germany, even in beer in Germany from grain, possibly from the pesticides. Um, the crazy thing is that CO2 is a viable alternative and relatively benign compared to fluorine gases. CO2 is very commonly used in Europe and is becoming more widely used in the US and Canada. And even propane for home refrigerators or ammonia in industrial applications are viable replacements. So it's not a matter of there's nothing else that can be used. There are actually widely used viable alternatives. Um, this is clearly not an essential use of a PFAS and it should be banned. And several countries in Europe are, do, are working on doing just that. The last group is uh, pharmaceuticals. So fluorine is commonly used to improve the performance of prescription drugs, including popular drugs like Lipitor and Prozac, and even one of the new COVID treatments. So in the OEC definition, these would be considered PFAS products. And while they may be considered essential as medications, it's possible that with the essential use approach, we could reduce some unnecessary uses of PFAS in the products. Um, or uses where safer alternatives existed. I wanted to wind up here with some ideas about what you can do um, as a purchaser. You have power and three things you can do are learn about where and how PFAS are used. We've already talked about things like stain proof and waterproof and, and um, and oil proof. And uh, those are things Those are sort of like trigger words that you should listen for if you're buying something that you think, oh, that could be something that would have PFAS in it. Um, so anytime you're purchasing something you suspect could have PFAS, you can ask your retailer. You know, if it's a, it's a couch that might have been treated with something you think like Scotchgard and they say, oh, we can add this treatment. Um, and you can say, well, does that contain PFAS? And they probably won't know. But even asking can make a difference. And they might say, what are PFAS? And you say, well, they're harmful chemicals and I don't wanna purchase them. And anyway, it starts pushing things up the chain of the command. And I think it makes a difference because businesses are listening to their customers. Um, you can also sort of apply, apply this essential use approach yourself. And you can ask yourself if the function is necessary, is there a safer alternative? Is it really worth the risk? And if it's not necessary for health and safety, maybe you can avoid it. I'm gonna give you some examples. You can choose furnishings and carpeting without water and stain repellency, including aftermarket sprays that contain PFAS. You can purchase waterproof clothing and gear only when you need the function of waterproofing, because not all jackets need to be waterproof. And you can look for PFAS free options with labels. As I mentioned, that's increasing. And um, believe it or not, some industries still advertise PFAS in their products as a selling point. So you might see PTFE advertised for bicycle lube. And if you can avoid that, then that would be a good thing. You can also avoid food in contact with greaseproof packaging. Um, PFAS are common in microwave popcorn bags, pizza boxes, and other fast food. And um, there are a lot of efforts now though to eliminate these uses of PFAS. So it's a little hard to tell, but you can do your best to try to um, learn about them and, and avoid them. And here's a couple of, a couple more resources I wanted to tell you about. Um, we have a website solely for sharing the latest PFAS news, science and policy. It's called pfascentral.org. And we update that weekly. So it's really easy to go there and see what's, what's new and get links to the, to the articles. And um, we have a page on there called PFAS Free Page, 
where we list companies and the products they sell without PFAS. And that is by far the most popular page on the site. We also recently re released um, what's called the PFAS Data Hub, which has, I just learned today is also very popular on our website. And on that page, we have nearly 100 categorized links to databases with PFAS information. So if you need to kind of learn about um, a lot about PFAS, whether it's in products or contamination sites or government and private sector initiatives, biomonitoring, toxicity reports, um, anything that where you're looking for data, that's kind of the, what that site is all about. And it's, it's real easy to navigate because it's just giving you links to other sites where you can find what you need, but it was meant to be kind of a one-stop shopping place. Um, you can go there, for example, and there's a lot of states with drinking water, the state drinking water um, maps, and you can find the Alaska state map of contaminated drinking water sites. Um, I, I wanted to mention one other thing that's not anything that we've been a part of, but I didn't know where else to put it in this presentation. Um, it just came out. Uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers did a report on analytical methods for PFAS in products in the environment. And I know a lot of NGOs are working now on PFAS in various products like textiles and food packaging and what methods should be used to test for PFAS. So I highly recommend this report. It's, it's a very comprehensive overview of worldwide regulations and testing approaches, and it's relatively easy to read for a non-scientist. And of course, I have to end with uh, mentioning some things on our website, greensciencepolicy.org, our main website. It's lots of information on the projects we've been involved in. You can read more about the class concept, PFAS in food packaging and cosmetics, we have the report I mentioned on building materials called Building a Better World. Uh, you can access the Madrid Statement and the many scientific publications we've collaborated on and read about relevant policy actions we've worked on. And with that, I wanna say, I hope that this has been informative and that you found things here that you may be able to use in your work or your life. And thank you for having me. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Kukowski, there are a few questions that have popped up here. Let's see. Yeah, early on, Ralph uh, Pentland asked, are regulatory measures in North America as effective as the REACH system in Europe? Um, and if not, what is preventing us? So are they as effective? I guess that's a, depends on how you measure effective. So the, the, well, there's the reach, the reach system can be more protective because it allows the, the, the assessments of chemicals to be based on hazards alone and not have to go into the exposure scenarios, which take a lot of time. Um, what Europe has done in terms of PFAS and the class-based approach that we hope will be very effective down the road is that um, the, the essential use approach that they're proposing, that non-essential uses of PFAS will be removed. So there's a great promise of that working. And I think a lot of people are looking to that to be an example because the essential use approach is just that at this point. It's, it's a way of thinking about it. It's a way of dealing with chemicals. And if you think about the history of risk assessment, you know, it's been entrenched for so long. It's a big deal for people to, to wrap their heads around a new approach. And um, personally, I think that regulatory agencies are a little bit, they're a little bit antsy about how to do this, but I'm not sure that this will even fall in the purview of regulatory agencies. I think this is more like a high level policy, um, um, it falls into the realm of policy, sort of like they did in Europe with their um, sustainability strategies and said, this is what we wanna do, now we're gonna figure out how to do it. And uh, so I think that that will be, we hope it'll be effective. I mean, there's a, certainly a lot of people who are saying, paying attention to PFAS and saying we need to get rid of them. Um, I think what the, some of the hurdles you asked about in the US have to do with, um, with just that, with, you know, how do you, they haven't come out with a big policy statement like that because they don't know how they would implement it. I really, you know, I don't want to comment too much on why they're not doing it, but it's a lot of it is the same old, um, you know, this is how we do things and we don't know how to do things another way. 
And so what's encouraging in the US, as I said, is what's happening at the state level really, which will put pressure on the federal government because companies are getting really frustrated with every state has its own rule. You can imagine 202 policies. Um, so hopefully that will make a difference. Excellent, thanks, thanks for that. David Dow asks, what types of analytical techniques are available to measure PFOS chemicals as a, as a class um, and at levels less than 10 parts per trillion or nanograms per liter? So that's where I would recommend, I mean, I can, I can tell you just that the, the analytical methods for that have to do with measuring total fluorine, total organic fluorine, total extractable fluorine. There's several different ways of doing that without having to know the specific PFAS that you're measuring. Um, if you really wanna know more about what are the um, detection levels for each of those different methods, I would suggest you go to the um, Nordic Council of Ministers report on PFAS and products in the environment. Um, if you Google that, then there's, there's because there's a lot of different factors that play into it. And so that describes those sorts of things you're asking about for each of the different um, product categories. I mean, they even have ski wax as a specific category, I think, but then something like cosmetics is the higher level category. And so it's easier to answer that question when you break it down that way. Thank you, that helps a lot. There's a question here from Julia Varshavsky can you speak to any information you might have on what companies who are phasing PFOS out are using instead? Um, for example, so what class of chemicals or what individual replacements are being made, if we know? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't, I don't know the answer. I think to some extent, I think that that might be it's sort of proprietary. Not a lot of people are sharing what they're using because that's where they're getting the competitive advantage is to say, I'm replacing, I'm getting rid of PFAS. And, you know, I'm the first one in, in my product sector to do that. And, um, and also to answer that question, I would need to know about all the different products and um, what types of replacements were effective in those categories. So sorry, I can't answer that very well, Julia, but thanks for the question. We do our best. But yeah. <laughs> there's a question, it's anonymous, but uh, they say, from what I understand, regulating PFOS as a class or multiple smaller subclasses is difficult because they don't all have the same mechanism of action or behave the same in the environment. Do you know if there are any current regulatory frameworks for regulating PFOS as a class or several subclasses? And is there any literature detailing any proposed technical approaches for deciding how to group PFOS? So I think that the, the EPA is working on that. They're looking at, I think it's 150 different PFAS now and, and ways to group them. Um, in my opinion, that's still going to fall far, far short of what we know about the thousands and thousands of other PFAS. So um, that is why we are promoting that the entire class be managed in an entirely different way because there are differences. They're not all going to do, have all the same health effects. They're not all equally mobile in the environment. Um, persistence is the one thing that, that holds them together as a class. And that's why that's such an important piece of, of the story is because it's that persistence that is so concerning. And it's the urgency also. If we had time to group them and study them in the way that we have been studying them using the methods that we know of, that would be one thing, but there's not time. I, so, and, and the only way to address them as an entire class is has, you have to go beyond the subgroup approach for that. So, and this is something that people have been thinking about for a long time that aren't fans of risk assessment and how it's conducted. And I have never seen another approach that gets even close to being as viable as the essential use approach. So that's why I've been a big promoter of that. That makes sense. There's a question here from Sky Wheeler. Uh, I would love to hear some advice on advocating on environmental health issues 
um, over all these years. Some of us are at the beginning of raising climate health impacts, for example, what works, what mistakes are easy to make. I'm sorry, what was the question? Sure, sure. Are, I think there are- what, what, in, what, in, the, in the whole realm of environmental health, what works and what mistakes are easy to make? You know, here's another one that I wish I could answer. I am not, I've come to this more from a science perspective and not what you're talking about is like strategic campaigning. And I think there's a lot of other nonprofits that are doing that. You know, there's the Mind the Store campaign that holds companies' feet to the fire with these report cards and saying that you are failing to address these chemicals in the way that we need them to be addressed. So that's a strategy. I think that's been very effective, um, but it's a strategic thing. And, um, you know, Safer States has been super effective at just pulling together all this information and, and raising awareness and helping harmonize um, the different states' approaches. Now, I'm not saying that they're necessarily doing that, but just by, by being able to see all the different bills, you know, one state could look and see what everyone else is doing. And I think before something like this was available, it would, it would have been really hard for states to know what all the other states are doing, even though I'm sure they have their own um, collaborative groups, possibly. Um, so, uh, I'm probably not the best person to answer a question about campaign strategies. Um, it probably depends also on what you want to accomplish. I do feel like uh, sometimes I feel like uh, climate scientists like 50 years ago were probably sitting in their offices saying, we have to do something about this. And it took a really long time to get it to the forefront. And I think when it comes to PFAS, even if people have been working on this for 10 or 20 years, I think it has risen to the top much more quickly because scientists are speaking out and finding ways to speak out and be involved in decision-making and, and working with nonprofits also and keeping them up to speed on, on important um, aspects of PFAS and collaborating, all of that has been great. Thank you for that, that answer, and that makes sense. Or no one's an expert in everything, but I do, yeah, I appreciate you sharing your perspective on it. Um, I think that's useful. There, we're, we are nearing the top of the hour here, but there's um, there are, there's a couple of questions here. One is about that searchable PFOS Tox database you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So were the studies reviewed for quality or you know methodology prior to inclusion in the database, or is it a listing of everything that's available? How often it's updated? Yeah, so we used systematic review methods, which is a very specific, precise way of, of reviewing the entire um, what's available. We looked at PubMed, that was the resource that we used. So anything that was available on PubMed, there were 15,000 studies and we screened them through screening processes that you use, use under systematic review methods. We chose all the ones that had health effects. So it's any study on, on these 29 PFAS that looked at any sort of health effect, even if it was just measuring somebody's weight. Um, and uh, that's what went into the database. And so we did not review them for quality. That would have been well beyond our, our scope. Um, and Julia Varshavsky, who answered the, uh, asked the question earlier, is now going to be hosting that database at Northeastern. And so we're very excited because that was that was produced by a collaboration of people who um, it started with TEDx, the Endocrine Disruption Exchange, where I was the director, and then we had to close in 2019. And so we all stayed together and kept working on it. But then once it was launched, we put it in the hands of Julia. So we're glad that it's going to continue and hopefully be updated. Great. One last question here from Anthony Tweedale. Um, any chance EPA would regulate? fluorine containing pesticide molecules as a class. Tony, I think you know the answer to that question. <laughs> my guess is no, but I don't really know. That, yeah, my guess would be no. Maybe, I mean, if you were going to, if the EPA was going to do a class approach, I think doing it for something like that, like within a product category would be the most likely way that they would do it. They might say for pesticides, we're gonna say no, no PFAS and pesticides. So it's possible, but I haven't heard anything about that. Thank you very much for that. And thanks so much for the presentation, um, for sharing your expertise with us and your time. Um, 
to everyone who joined us. Thank you for your attention. I'll send out an email with an updated list of resources and a link to a recording of this presentation and Q&A pretty much you know, today, later today or tomorrow morning. And our next Che Alaska webinar is scheduled for Wednesday, May 25th, the last Wednesday in May. And we're gonna have a presentation on the impacts of nuclear power generation uh, in Alaska on Alaskans. So from uranium mining in the state to, to power production and, uh, and waste storage. Please donate to support these Che Alaska webinars if you can, and ACAT's other efforts. You can give online at our website, akaction.org. And uh, yeah, with any additional questions or comments or suggestions, please do uh, reach out to us uh, by email or by phone, 907-222-7714. And yeah, thanks so much again, Dr. Krakowski, and uh, wishing everyone all a wonderful rest of your day and week. Bye for now.